welcome to the module Space and Time. Um, I hope that you're all doing well, uh, despite current circumstances, obviously not being really ideal for anybody. Um, so normally this module, like um, uh, all the others the philosophy department offers, is, uh, is taught in person rather than online. Um, so I hope that uh, despite the fact that maybe it's not optimal to, to, to be teaching online, um, nevertheless, this this module um, is is enjoyable, and that you uh, get um, uh, a reasonable amount out of it. Um, so I think that um, hopefully, kind of administrative issues to do with this module, so things like seminars, um, assessments, readings, and so on. Hopefully, they've been covered in the email um, that I sent out um, a bit earlier. Um, and also, uh, these topics are addressed quite extensively on the, the Moodle page um, for the module. Um, so, uh, I don't really propose to spend uh, time recapping that. Um, if any of you does have any sort of questions relating to the course structure or um, uh, sort of admin questions, then uh, please do drop me an email uh, and hopefully... Uh, uh, I can help you to resolve them. Um, so uh, I'd like to kind of move on quickly to the, the sort of substance of the module. So um, the module obviously is called Space and Time. Um, the first more or less half of the module is focused on more on space. Uh, the second half of the module is focused more on time. Um, but we'll see there's lots of connections between these topics and there's good reason that we study them together. Um, one connection, I suppose, becomes obvious, hopefully in kind of weeks four and five, uh, when we start to look at the topic of special relativity. Um, now, what we'll find is that in special relativity, um, it turns out that, that maybe time and space aren't quite as distinct as we might kind of intuitively think that they are, or that people might have thought back in the time of Newton and so on. Um, and actually, these, these uh, maybe maybe we can't draw sharp, sharp distinctions between uh, spatial and temporal relations. Um, so that's one, one example of a reason that we might want to study uh, these things together. So the first part of the module, as I say, will focus on space. And uh, a very important part of what we'll be looking at is um, a kind of significant uh, philosophical debate, um, but not limited to philosophers, actually one in which uh, many physicists have uh, participated too. Um, and that's the debate between, on the one hand, a group of people known as absolutists about space. Um, absolutists believe roughly speaking, that um, space um, uh, exists in its own right. It exists independently of objects uh, that fill the space. Um, on the other hand, we have a camp uh, known as the Relationist Camp, according to which uh, space doesn't exist in its own right or independently of the things that, that inhabit that space, but rather space is, is nothing over and above uh, spatial relations between objects and maybe maybe events. Um, so that's the topic that we'll be kicking off with. And uh, particularly this week, we're going to be focusing on how that debate played out um, in, in Newtonian times. So the sort of early modern period, um, so um, 17th, 18th century. Um, and and then going forward, we'll see how it applies in the context of more more recent uh, physics. So, um, kind of without further ado, we'll move on to the um, the the that uh, I'll sort of talk to the handout um, that that is now on Moodle uh, for this week, um, and use that as a basis for 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 structuring what I'll say. Um, so, I've said a bit just briefly already about um, what absolutism and relationalism are. Um, so, 
Um, uh, as I said, the handout, maybe this is the central debate in the philosophy of space, the one between absolutists and relationists. I think that's that's probably true. Um, so the, the absolutist, um, as I said, um, they really regard space as um, a thing in its own right. So it has independent existence of the objects or other things that might uh, inhabit that space. So, I mean, there are a few ways of thinking about that. Um, so one way of thinking about it is um, by way of an analogy, right? So you might think that, uh, I mean, a sort of common analogy is to think of space as being something like a, a fish tank. Um, so, yeah, the tank exists and you can put stuff in it like water and fish. Um, uh, but, you know, the tank would exist um, perfectly well, even if there were no water or fish in it. Um, it has its own sort of independent reality. Um, so that's a kind of analogy. It's not a perfect analogy by any means because uh, fish tanks have sides. Uh, they're certainly not infinite in size. Um, but at least some absolutists do think that space is infinite in size. So um, uh, yet they think it's, you know, perfectly real, uh, just like a fish tank is real. Um, but they don't think it has uh, boundaries in the way that a fish tank uh, does. Um, so uh, Newton's an example of uh, an absolutist who yet thought that uh, space was, was infinite uh, or boundless. Um, so the fish tank analogy isn't great, but maybe it'll give you a sort of gist, um, uh, uh, the gist of sort of what we're what we're talking about. Um, another way of thinking about what the absolutist is saying is to think about a sort of certain counterfactual, um, and this counterfactual concerns a world um, without any objects in it, any ordinary objects in it, like tables and chairs and. Uh, maybe electrons or people or mountains and so on. So um, the the absolutist is going to say that it makes perfect sense uh, to think about um, uh, the possibility, at least in principle, of there being an empty space. Uh, it could be uh, that uh, space should exist even though there were nothing at all within it, right? Uh, if we subtracted all the objects, we'd still have space, the container. Um, that that would still um, uh, be be um, something that's real um, and that exists. Um, now, the, the relationist it, uh, takes um, kind of the opposite view. So uh, for them, for the relationist, uh, space uh, isn't independent of the objects in it. Um, it doesn't make sense uh, to think about space without any objects in it. Um, there simply could could be no such thing because space is purely relational. Um, so for them, the 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 kind of uh, fish tank analogy. Uh, is one that's just deeply flawed, right? So we might imagine a fish tank without stuff in it, um, but the idea of a space without stuff in it just makes no sense. Space just isn't independent of the stuff within it. So um, it's worth putting out a bit of terminology at this stage. So the absolutists are sometimes called substantivalists. That's another word for or term for the absolutist view, uh, substantivalism about space. Um, what does that mean? Well, basically the idea is that an absolutist is treating space like a substance in its own right. So that's why we call them substantivalists, right? So I guess in, in philosophy, kind of traditionally, um, the notion of a substance is a notion precisely of something that has an independent reality or an independent existence. Um, sometimes, and um, uh, I guess we'll um, um, 
yeah, I mean, so I guess maybe this will be helpful. So, 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 uh, distinction is often made in philosophy between, for instance, um, a substance and properties. So you might think a table is a substance. It might have uh, brownness or the color brown as one of its properties. Um, and the idea is there's a sense in which um, the the table exists or has its own reality that's uh, independent. Whereas uh, you might say that sort of brownness exists, but um, it kind of depends for its existence, uh, arguably, uh, on um, the being an object to to have that property. So that's the sort of sense in which substances, you know, are independent, whereas maybe other categories of thing like uh, like properties are, are maybe dependent. Um, so uh, for the absolutist. Uh, space is uh, substance-like or independent, doesn't depend for its existence on um, anything else. In particular, it doesn't depend for its existence uh, on um, regular objects being around to, to inhabit that space. Whereas for the, the relationist, it's just going to be constituted by the relations between uh, ordinary objects. Now, I mean, there is a sense in which maybe um, relationalism is a bit puzzling. You might think, well, um, what are these relations between ordinary objects that constitute space? Um, the answer is going to be spatial relations, and then that's maybe a bit puzzling. You might think, well, how can these relations be spatial if we're not already granted that there exists a space? Um, we'll come back onto onto this um, this topic uh, later, um, but hopefully by now you can at least see that you know what roughly speaking what the debate looks like, um, and we'll 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 try and fill that out as we as we go along. Okay, so um, another thing so to 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 know about uh, the absolutists about space is that people who are absolutist about space are normally absolutist about certain other things. Um, and one thing that they're normally absolutist about is absolute motion. So the motion of an object, right? So uh, normally uh, an absolutist about space would think that there is such a thing as absolute motion right so there's just a fact of the matter about whether an object is moving uh, and also maybe how fast it's moving um, that is independent of whether anything else is moving or how fast anything else is moving right so the reason that the absolutist about space will normally be an absolutist about motion is because if you're an absolutist about space, then it's quite easy to make sense of the notion of absolute motion. So uh, absolute motion would just be motion relative to absolute space, right? Rather than motion relative to any other ordinary object like a table or chair or an electron. So we can just define absolute motion in terms of the change in position of an object um, in absolute space as time goes on. So the idea would be, for, for instance, for me to be in absolute motion would simply be a matter of me occupying um, a particular point in absolute space at one time and then occupying a different point in absolute space uh, at another time, right? So we can perfectly well define it. Uh, we don't need to appeal to any objects besides me and space itself, right? So in order to define it, we don't need to talk about how I move relative to the table or anything like that. So that gives us a sense in which we've got absolute space. Now, obviously, if you're a relationist, there is no absolute space. So you can't define motion straightforwardly in terms of change of absolute position. So um, 
relationists about space tend to be um, uh, relationists about motion too. They, in other words, they think there is no such thing as a, what you might call true motion or absolute motion, but only relative motion to this or that object. Again, this is something that we'll uh, see in more detail uh, as we progress. Now, okay, so if you have the notion of absolute motion, um, then it also seems to make sense to talk about things like absolute velocity and absolute acceleration. Um, so, I mean, velocity, in a sense, is like motion. Um, so the difference between straightforward motion, or speed, as we might call it, um, and velocity is just that velocity is directed, right? So um, if I'm moving at 10 miles an hour and you're moving at 10 miles an hour, um, then we don't, although we have the same speed, it might be that we don't have the same velocity, right? So if you're traveling westward and I'm traveling eastward, um, then that's the case in which, although we've got the same speed, we, we have differing velocities, just in virtue of the fact um, that we're, we're traveling in different directions. Okay, so, I mean, just to sort of give the, the kind of formal definition of velocity, that's given us um, equality one on the handout. Um, so velocity is defined as a uh, change in position with respect to time. Um, don't worry if you, you're not a fan of or uh, particularly acquainted with, with calculus or derivatives or anything like that. Uh, the equations aren't really essential uh, to, to understanding the conceptual point. Um, and, of course, um, if you think that velocity uh, is absolute. Um, so uh, velocity uh, is, absolute velocity is just defined in terms of changing absolute uh, position in space. Um, then it also might make sense for you to think that acceleration, um, which is another quantity, uh, is absolute or that we can make sense of absolute acceleration because ordinarily at least acceleration is just defined as change in velocity right so uh something accelerates uh if its velocity is changing over time um so um one way i mean i guess when people talk about acceleration when, when they think about cars and things, I think normally they just have in mind change of speed, right? Um, so you, you ex and particularly uh, an increase in speed, uh, in I guess in ordinary talk, people tend to equate acceleration with an increase in speed. So if you're in a car and you start off traveling at 60 miles an hour um, and you increase your speed to 100 miles an hour, um, then you've accelerated. And that's true, you have accelerated if you do that. But there are other forms of acceleration too. So um, uh, acceleration in the technical sense already in also includes what might in ordinary talk be referred to as deceleration. Um, so um, a decrease in speed, right? So um, it, um, if you went from 100 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour, well, that's acceleration in the, in the, in the proper sense. Um, it's a, just a, chain, a change in velocity. Um, but also, and this is, this is worth noting because it'll come up again later, um, remember that velocity isn't the same as speed um, because uh, direction matters when it comes to defining velocity. Um, and acceleration, uh, properly speaking, is defined as a change in velocity, um, not just a change in speed. So uh, two on the handout is the the, the sort of for, you know, I guess the formal definition. Um, so an acceleration a is defined in in terms of the 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 change in velocity. 
um, with respect to time. Um, so one way of changing velocity is obviously by changing speed. Uh, so you could increase or decrease your speed. That would count as an acceleration. Uh, but another way of uh, accelerating, or in other words, changing your velocity, is to change direction, right? So although, again, this isn't really... When we talk about acceleration in sort of everyday speak, uh, we don't normally think of mere changes of direction as accelerations. Uh, but technically speaking, strictly speaking, that is an acceleration. If you, that is to say, if you are traveling at 60 miles in your, uh, an hour in your car um, and you don't speed up or, or slow down, but merely turn a corner, well, technically that actually counts as acceleration, even though we not, might not ordinarily uh, uh, describe it as such in everyday language. Okay, so um, <clears throat> since acceleration, uh, well, we, we already saw that if you are an absolutist about space, um, so you think there are, you know, absolute position so an absolute position would just be a position in absolute space um, <clears throat> then since velocity is defined in terms of uh, change in absolute position um, then it makes sense to, to if you believe in absolute position to believe in um, absolute velocity um, and likewise <clears throat> since acceleration is defined in terms of change in velocity, then if you believe in absolute velocity, then uh, presumably you can make sense of the notion of absolute acceleration. So an absolute acceleration is just going to be a change in absolute velocity, which in turn is a change in absolute position, uh, which in turn uh, uh, is just understood in terms of position in, in absolute space. So... These things all tend to go hand in hand. If you're an absolutist about space, you'll be an absolutist about velocity and an absolutist about acceleration. I say tend to because we'll see that there are exceptions. Um, uh, this will come up, um, particularly next week. All right. So, um, I mean... On the other hand, of course, if you're a relationist um, and you think that there's no such thing as absolute position, then uh, maybe you're going to have to um, think um, that all motion is relative um, and uh, so all velocity and acceleration is, is relative. Again, something we'll come back to. All right, so... Um, Right, okay, so let's think a bit about how this notion that perhaps space is absolute um, relates to various uh, physical theories. So it seems that certain... Um, physical theories might tend to support absolutism and potentially others might tend to support uh, relationalism about space. Um, I say tend to, it doesn't normally, it normally is a tendency, right? So it's normally not the case that a given theory of physics or a given physical theory uh, will conclusively uh, support uh, uh, relationalism or conclusively support absolutism um, but it might um, make one or the other theory look like a more attractive th metaphysical theory of space um, and th the fact that this is a sort of just a tendency rather than a definitive uh, establishing maybe explains why th this debate over absolutism and uh, relationism has raged so fiercely and for so long. Now, when it comes, so I mean, first we'll think about um, a, a very old physical theory um, that um, is not taken seriously by any 
physicists these days. Um, actually, on this physical theory, uh, Aristotelian physics, um, it does rather seem that 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 uh, we have to believe in in uh, absolutism if we're going to adopt this physics. Um, perhaps unlike some of the the later physical theories that we'll consider. Um, so, yeah, as I say, Aristotelian physics um, seems to presuppose an absolutism about space. Um, according to Aristotelian physics, um, there's such a thing as the centre of the universe. Um, and the centre of the universe um is kind of important because it helps explain stuff the the location of the center of the universe helps to explain the behavior of objects so according to aristotelian physics um i guess this is a very a very sort of quick overview we're not really going to dwell on it um uh be, because it's pretty obviously false um uh but it's just a sort of a nice little illustration i think um so Aristotelian physics, um, uh, you have the the five elements um, uh, which behave in different ways. Um, uh, so earth, air, uh, fire, water, and ether. Um, and roughly Aristotelian's idea is that they sort of each of these elements has its proper place in the universe and kind of strives to achieve its its proper place in the universe. Um, so Earth will strive to reach the, the, the element Earth, will strive to reach the centre of the universe. Um, now, the centre of the universe, um, on the Aristotelian view, um, is the... The planet Earth, or the center of the planet Earth, um, which I guess is what's supposed to explain why there's so much Earth, um, as in Earth the element, uh, or in or on Earth the planet, right? Because the element Earth strives to be at the center of the universe, and the center of the Earth is uh, the center of the universe. Um, right. Okay. So, so the center of the universe. Um, does some explanatory work in Aristotelian physics. Um, its location helps to explain why things that are largely made of the element Earth, um, such as rocks, um, uh, tend towards it, right? So this is supposed to explain why an, uh, a rock, if it's dropped, will uh, fall to the ground while it's striving to the centre of the universe because... A rock is an object that's mostly composed of the element Earth. Um, <clears throat> but it, notice that if you're going to appeal to a notion like the centre of the universe, then it seems that you're taking a kind of absolutist stand about space, right? So um, um, it's not that clear how the relationist can make sense of the notion of the centre of the universe, they might have to say, you know, I guess they could try, they'd, they'd have to say maybe it's the centre of mass or something of all objects. So they could do that, but then um, uh, it's not clear that you could then explain the behaviour of objects uh, in terms of the centre of the universe without any circularity, right? So it looks like um, what the Aristotelian wants to do is say, look, you know, there is this objective centre that has nothing to do with how matter is arranged. And then we're going to appeal to the fact that there's this centre of the universe um, in order to explain uh, how matter behaves, how it comes to be arranged. Um, and so it looks like the centre of the universe has got to be a sort of absolute and independently existing thing. Okay, so, yeah, so, I mean, I guess all that doesn't matter too much, right? So, because no one really takes anything along these lines, along the, the lines of um, 
uh, of Aristotelian physics very seriously these days. Um, so let's look at a, a, a much more serious um, uh, physical system, um, albeit one that um, is is not generally accepted these days, but certainly seems to do a lot better job um, of doing of predicting the behaviours of objects than Aristotelian physics did. And that's uh, Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian physics. Um, Newtonian physics is, um, I mean, has just been enormously influential um, in the history of science and the history of philosophy. Um, it does a lot of things very, very well, right? So, um, um they, it, I mean, so, you know, engineers still use principles of Newtonian physics. Um, uh, I guess, you know, it's sort of commonly pointed out that, um, um, I don't know if this is still true, but um, uh, satellites are launched uh, in, into orbit um, uh, using uh, predictions based on... Um, on Newtonian physics, um, I, m m I guess maybe, m m maybe when we're 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 uh, certainly when we're launching, um, some missions that are going to de uh, explore the depths of the solar system. I guess presumably these days we take into account, or maybe we always did, uh, general relativistic effects. Um, uh, which don't appear in Newtonian physics, but but certainly phys Newtonian physics takes us quite a long way. Um, uh, it's radically different from Aristotelian physics, um, but also, I mean, I said on the hand that it, it it presupposes an absolutist conception of space. Now, um, I guess that's sort of true. Um, certainly, Newton wanted to subscribe to the idea that um, space is absolute. Um, and at least uh, if we take all of Newton's principles, Newton's laws at face value, then it looks like it's presupposing absolutism. There might be, as we'll see later in term, there might be ways around this, so you might be able to do something like Newtonian physics um, without presupposing absolutism, but it's a bit more complicated. Um, so, so um, I, I guess this is a case where we could say that Newtonian physics tends to, uh, you know, support or or maybe tends to presuppose um, uh, something like an absolutist conception of space. So, I guess to see this, right, so uh, consider, for instance, Newton's first law, which is on the handout here. So, um, Newt Newton's first law, um, again, taken at face value, seems to presuppose that, that space is absolute. Um, so, Newton's first law says... Roughly speaking, that if an object isn't acted upon by a force, then it will re remain at rest if it was initially at rest. And if it is initially moving, it will continue to move at the same velocity as it originally was. So it's a, a law of inertia, right? So in order to change the velocity of an object, you have to impart a force upon it. Um, Otherwise, it will continue um, to move at the same velocity as uh, it, it did to start with. So that could be zero velocity, right? So that's the case in which it's at rest. Or it could have some positive velocity. So I guess if you've got a, um, a, a, sat a satellite or a, a rocket moving through space, um, you know, without the engines on, um, without significant gravitational influences, uh, without at least significant uh, frictional effects because there's uh, uh, very little gas um, 
uh, in outer space, um, then at least to an approximation, this is going to follow Newton's first law, right? So um, uh, because there's almost no force on it, um, the idea is that it will keep moving inertially. That is to say, it will keep moving at the same velocity. It won't speed up, slow down, or change direction. Okay, so how, in what way does Newton's first law, at least um, if we express it like this, seem to presuppose absolute space? Well, one way in which it seems to presuppose absolute space is that it talks about constant velocity. So if an, act, an object isn't acted on by force, then it will continue to move at the same velocity. Now, at face value at least, um, the velocity being talked about is absolute velocity, um, which as we saw can be made as we saw can be made sense of in terms of absolute uh, position, um, which seems to presuppose a notion of absolute space, right? So um, and and so it seems to presuppose absolute velocity just because it talks about the same velocity. It doesn't talk about the same relative velocity. Right, so um, if we think about, um, uh, if we want to think about relative velocity, we'd have to think about um, uh, what to define that velocity relative to. So, um, if you, you, for instance, you might uh, move at a given velocity relative to the sun. Um, um, maybe a simpler example might be. Um, uh, consider two cars uh, that are traveling uh, down a motorway. Um, suppose that one, well, suppose for simplicity, they're both traveling in the same direction along the motorway. Uh, one is uh, traveling at 60 miles an hour. The other is traveling at 100 miles an hour. Um, then uh, in, in relative terms, we can say that the second term, sorry, the second car is traveling at 40 miles an hour relative to the um, the, the first car because that's the excess uh, speed that it's traveling at compared to the first car. So in relation to the first car, the second car's moving at 40 miles an hour. So that's a relative velocity. But obviously, we kind of supposed that we could also sensibly talk about absolute velocity. Um, uh, and in absolute terms, we want to say that the second car is traveling at 100 miles an hour, whereas the first car is traveling at 60 miles an hour. Um, now, so Newton's first law, it just seems to, it just talks about velocity, right? So it doesn't talk about velocity relative to something, relative to the sun or relative to the the center of mass of the universe or relative to uh, my my car or something like that. Uh, and so it seems to be deploying a notion of absolute velocity. Okay. Um, so that that's a sort of fairly straightforward way in which it seems to be assuming that talk of absolute velocity and hence presumably talk of absolute position makes sense um so and, and and ultimately therefore seems to presuppose that that space is absolute but there's a sort of more subtle way in which it does this as well so in particular newton's first law seems to presuppose that space itself has a certain sort of structure um and I suppose to, to, to talk as though space has a particular structure is to treat it as like a substance, right? How could it have a structure if it, if it wasn't something like a substance, you, you might wonder. Maybe there are ways of making sense of this, but, you know, at least it's, um, it seems more straightforward to make sense of. If, if we suppose that space is absolute. So in what sense does it presuppose that space has a structure? Well, in a subtle way, uh, namely that because it says that an object 
that's not acted on by force will continue to move in the same direction indefinitely. Essentially, that's to assume that uh, a straight line in space can be continued indefinitely, right? So the idea is that the, the object is moving inertially in space. Um, and what that means is either it's at rest or it's moving at a constant velocity. Um, if it's moving at constant velocity, then effectively it's moving in a straight line, right? So um, it's not changing direction. Um, a change in direction would be an acceleration, as we saw earlier. Um, so Newton's first law says that if we have one of these objects that's traveling in a straight line and we don't impart any force on it, then it's going to carry on moving in a straight line. Um, it will uh, at the same speed. Um, and it will do so for as long as we don't impart a force on it. But that seems to presuppose that you can just carry on traversing a, the same straight line indefinitely, right? You're not going to bump up against an edge of space or something like that, right? So that's not true in a goldfish tank, right? Because goldfish tanks have edges. So if the goldfish uh, moves at a constant speed in a straight line, then eventually it's going to run into a problem, right? It's going to hit the side of the tank. Um, and um, uh, uh, that's going to cause it to, to slow uh, and possibly to change direction. So it's going to cause an acceleration. But um, the first law seems to suppose that space isn't like that, that you can just extend any straight line in space indefinitely and can carry on traversing that. And so it sort of it assumes a certain structure to space. Uh, and this ability to extend straight lines indefinitely, actually we'll see next week that that corresponds to an important axiom of what's known as Euclidean space. We'll come back to what that means. Um, essentially, Euclid gave a set of axioms that seems to describe uh, what a certain sort of space is like, right? And it seems that Newton uh, presupposed um, that space was Euclidean. It turns out there are alternatives. We can have non-Euclidean spaces. Um, and indeed, um, uh, general relativity suggests that the, the, the space of our universe is in fact non-Euclidean. Uh, but, but never mind that for now. The, po the point for present purposes is that in suggesting that space has a structure, maybe a Euclidean structure, it seems that Newtonian mechanics is, in this sort of indirect, subtle way, uh, presupposing perhaps that it's substance-like or absolute. Okay, so that's enough on that for now. Um, perhaps something a bit more entertaining, hopefully, um, and a bit less abstract. So Newton... Um, who we're going to focus on uh, for 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 the rest of today? Uh, we'll see some. We'll we'll discuss some challenges to the Newtonian picture uh, in the coming weeks. But Newton himself was perfectly happy with the idea that his physics, uh, his his laws, uh, presupposed the notion of absolute space. Um, he was very well aware. Well, he he explicitly made this assumption. Um, this isn't something that you know philosophers have have kind of suggested. He 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 has to presuppose later on. Uh, he himself um, endorsed this assumption of absolute space, and actually argued. He provided an argument himself that was independent, um, at least at first glance, independent of his um, physics. Um, for the view that space is absolute or substantival. Um, now, this argument 
relies actually on the results of an experiment. So Newton thought that we could actually have empirical evidence, experimental evidence, that space is like a substance, uh, that, that space is absolute. And this experiment, which is easy to conduct, uh, you can uh, try it at home, um, is known as Newton's bucket experiment. Um, now, hopefully just to liven up the visuals a bit, uh, I've got a, a video um, of me um, ably assisted by my French bulldog, George, uh, conducting uh, Newton's bucket experiments. Um, Obviously, George was in charge. Uh, I helped. I was his sort of assistant. Um, uh, but he explained to me um, what the significance of this was as far as Newton, Newton was concerned. And I'll try and do a reasonable job of conveying that same thing to you. So basically, I'm gonna, I've got this video um, of the experiment. Um, I'll just briefly explain what the setup is. Then I'll allow you just to watch it um, without me talking, and then I'll talk and and um, uh, try to explain what Newton thought um, this experiment showed and why he thought it established the existence of absolute space. So the setup we've got here is well in Newton's. Uh, experiment. It was a bucket. Um, in this case, it's a bottle, uh, just because that was easier, um, that has some water in it. Um, now, I've got this bottle, basically tied a bit of string around the neck of the bottle, uh, tied the string in turn to uh, the ceiling, well, a light, light fitting on the ceiling. Um, <clears throat> and basically twisted the string around a bunch of times. Um, so I twist it round, um, and then eventually, once it's all twisted up, I release it, and we're going to see what happens. So first we'll just watch, uh, and then I'll seek to explain a bit about what's going on. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll carry on playing that, just running that past you a few times so that you can um, carry on having a look at what's going on. So basically what's happened is I twisted this string around, um, then eventually released it. And as the, the string unwinds, uh, obviously the, the bottle uh, starts to, to spin. Um, so... That's 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 um, you know uh, pretty boring so far, um, but what the interesting part of this experiment is what happens to the water inside the bucket or in this case bottle, um, and particularly what happens to the surface of the water. So hopefully, what you'll be able to see um, is that when uh, the bottle is stationary at the beginning of the experiment, uh, the surface of the water there is flat. Once I release the bottle and the bottle starts to spin, the surface of the water uh, becomes more and more concave. Um, so it's it's not flat at all um, until the, the, the bottle starts to slow down again. Uh, it's increasingly concave. Um, so essentially the water or some of the water is riding up the edges and away from the center um and obviously then as the the bottle slows down again um the surface of the water uh, starts to flatten out again until the end of the experiment when the bottle's stationary and the surface of the water is is flat um so okay so um th this Experiment in a way might not look very surprising to us. So, what does seem to be surprising is that Newton thought this could um, prove um, this uh, 
thesis about the ontological status of space, namely that space is absolute, that might strike you as, as pretty weird that you can uh, infer that from such a straightforward experiment. So uh, in, how did Newton reason about this, right? So basically, Newton's interested in this physical effect, uh, the concavity of the water the the in other words the the way that the the water deviates from from being flat uh this is if you like an experimental effect uh so an interesting phenomenon that's to be explained so um basically what newton's going to do is he's going to say that we can explain this if we invoke the idea that space is absolute but we can't explain it if we uh, think that uh, space is not absolute and instead uh, endorse a, 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 a relationalism about space. So, OK, so so how's that going to work? So, well, think about how we explain it on the assumption that we um, that we endorse absolutism. Right, so on the absolutist view, um, there is a clear difference um, between the beginning of the experiment and the sort of middle phase when the water is very concave. There's a difference that goes beyond the, the shape of the surface of the water. Um, <clears throat> that difference is that um, at the beginning of the experiment, the um uh the 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 bucket or the the bottle and the water are at rest um i i guess you can't really quite say that they're at absolute rest we'll come back to this right so so they're not uh it'd be a bit dodgy to say they're absolute rest because what i mean what they're really at rest with respect to are things like the surface of the earth um and you know the room they're in and so on um uh, obviously the surface of the Earth probably isn't an absolute rest, um, given the fact that the Earth's orbiting the Sun and it's spinning on its axis. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, basically, Newton's going to say that the, the 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 motion of the 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 Earth is irrelevant to explaining the concavity of the water. Um, so what Newton's going to say is like just you know, forget about the uh, the movement of the Earth for now. Um, uh, it looks like the the bucket to begin with is a, is a, is at rest, and the water's at rest within it. Um, and then, obviously, kind of halfway through the experiment, uh, that's very much not the case, right? So the 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 bottle is in motion; it's spinning. Um, and the water within it is also spinning. Um, basically, the friction uh, between the uh, water and the edge of the bucket or bottle uh, imparts spin uh, upon the water itself. Um, so we've got spinning water, uh, which in a, the sort of uh, uh, as you get in. In the case of a whirlpool in the sea, um, induces a concavity um, of the the water surface. So that's what Newton thinks is going on. Now, um, so the key difference um, uh, that explains uh, the concavity of the surface of the water um, in the middle of the experiment. Um, is that at that point the uh, the bucket and the water are in motion, uh, whereas to begin with they were at rest, um, forgetting, setting aside for the moment the fact that the Earth's in motion, and so um, so presumably they're 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 in motion in the same way as the Earth itself. Um, so that aside, as I say for now. Um, so yeah, okay. So so in in explaining the concavity, we're we're appealing to motion seemingly absolute motion um actually more strictly speaking uh 
what we're appealing to is absolute acceleration. So uh, remember that uh, acceleration, um, uh, change of speed is acceleration, but also change of direction um, is acceleration. And so in the middle of the experiment, um, forget about whether the bottle's speeding up or slowing down. Um, and correspondingly, whether the water's speeding up or slowing down, um, um, even if they were at constant speed, um, they'd both be accelerating in the sense that uh, the direction of their movement is changing. Um, so if you think about um, a point on the edge of the bottle, um, then actually the motion is a circular one, right? It's a spin. Um, and, uh, and so the, the, uh, even if it's not changing speed, um, then, uh, the, uh, part of the bottle's edge, uh, is changing direction constantly and therefore, um, by the technical definition is accelerating. And so the idea then is that the behavior of the water can be explained in terms of absolute, its absolute acceleration um, at the midpoint of the experiment um, compared to its rest at the beginning of the experiment. So we have a difference that can explain the observable difference, the, 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 the uh, change in the shape of the surface of the water. Now, <clears throat> absolute acceleration, um, for Newton is defined in terms of absolute velocity. It's just change in absolute velocity, uh, which in terms, in turn, is defined in terms of absolute position. Um, so, absolute velocity, changing. Uh, sorry, absolute velocity is de de defined in terms of change in absolute position. Absolute acceleration is defined in terms of change in absolute velocity. Um, so we have an explanation, he thinks, or we can give an explanation of what's happening in terms of a difference in absolute velocity. Um, now, the question is, can the relationists do the same? Could you explain what's going on uh, with the water, why it changes its surface shape uh, instead in terms of um, uh, in terms of relative velocity or relative motion, perhaps? Uh, rather than absolute velocity. And Newton denies that you can, right? Because what he says is that think about the beginning of the experiment and the midway point of the experiment. So he says, well, at the beginning of the experiment, um, the water doesn't seem to be moving um, relative to the bottle. It's stationary relative to the bottle. Um, and it's stationary relative to the room and relative to the surface of the earth. Um, you know, maybe it's moving relative to the sun or something like that but that doesn't really seem particularly relevant to the physical effects going on here um <clears throat> uh or certainly he doesn't think so um so at the beginning of the experiment it looks like the water is at rest relative to um anything that might might be important to explaining the shape of the water at the beginning of the experiment. But what he points out is that the midpoint of the experiment, <clears throat> the water is also at rest relative to the bucket, um, or in this case, the bottle, uh, which seems to be the most uh, important physical object that it interacts with. So the what goes on actually is that um, at the beginning of the experiment, neither, excuse me, uh, neither the uh, uh, the bottle uh, or the water 
is we might say an absolute motion, which means that they're um, not in relative motion relative to one another. Now, initially what goes on in this experiment is that the, uh, the bottle is moving faster than the water. Um, and gradually the water speeds up and uh, catches up in terms of speed as uh, frictional force is imparted by the sides of the bottle. Um, until eventually, and you can prove this is so basically by drawing a, a spot on the side of the bottle and also putting a drop of dye in the water, you can prove that eventually the the water is um, at the sort of midpoint of the experiment moving at the same speed as the bottle. So that the drop of dye in the water will be stationary with respect to the uh, blob of ink on the, the side of the bottle. So here's the take home message. At the beginning of the experiment, the water isn't moving relative to the bottle, and nor is it moving relative to the bottle at the midpoint of the experiment. Um, at the beginning of the experiment, the absolutist is going to say they're both at absolute rest, or at least forget the movement of the earth and so on. At the midpoint of the experiment, they're going to say they're both in absolute motion and indeed absolutely accelerating. And that's the physical difference that explains the concavity of the water in the midpoint uh, and the flatness of the water at the beginning. But the Relationist doesn't have that explanation available to them because they can't appeal to absolute motion or absolute acceleration. And they can't either appeal to a difference in the relative motion of the water because neither at the beginning of the experiment nor at the midpoint is the water moving relative to the bottle. At both stages, it's stationary relative to the bottle even though the absolutist would want to say that uh, at the midpoint of the experiment, both are in absolute motion. So the claim is, Newton's claim is, that we simply can't explain this difference by appealing to relative motion at all uh, alone. Uh, so we need to invoke, to explain this physical effect, we have to invoke absolute motion um, and therefore absolute space. And so he thinks this physical effect demonstrates that space exists, absolute space exists. Now, okay, so you might say, well, what about the fact that, um, um, yeah, you, know, you might say, sure, the 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 water isn't moving relative to the bottle at the midpoint of the experiment, um, but it is moving relative to the room and relative to the surface of the earth and so on at the midpoint of the experiment, whereas it's not at the beginning of the experiment. And you might say it's that relational movement, not the relational movement to the bottle, because there is none, but the relational movement in relation to the, the room or the surface of the earth that explains why the water's concave at the midpoint of the experiment. So basically Newton thinks, well, the room's kind of irrelevant to this physical effect. It, um, the room shouldn't really make a difference, and nor should the surface of the earth. Um, so, I mean, that's one way maybe Newton, you know, I mean, that's one sort of response Newton has. But he also attempts to um, argue that, uh, to sort of reinforce this line of argument by suggesting that, that basically, if we were to put the bucket and the water into uh, uh, a completely empty space, right, so we're supposed to imagine counterfactually that there's a universe in which there's nothing but the buckets and the water, um, then nevertheless, there could be a difference between whether the... Uh, uh, so uh, there could be a difference between um, states of the uh, of the water surface. So um, we, we could, in an otherwise empty space, have... Uh, a case in which the uh, the water's flat uh, and a case in which the water's concave. And the only way of explaining that would be in terms of absolute motion of the bucket. And that's because in an otherwise empty space, there is nothing uh, besides the bucket for the water to be moving relative to. Now, actually, Newton um, 
prefers a variant of the experiment when he's talking about this sort of maybe more fanciful possibility of an otherwise empty space. Um, rather than a bucket in water, he has us consider uh, two spheres um, that are rotating. The, uh, the, uh, the, they're, they're rotating around um, the point um, uh, in between the two spheres. He imagines that the two spheres are connected by a, a length of rope um, and they're just rotating around one another um, attached by that piece of rope. Now, Newton's point is that, you know, suppose nothing else in the universe existed apart from the two spheres uh, and the rope. Um, then he says, well, we'd, we'd be able to tell um, whether these, um, these, uh, these spheres were in motion or not. And the reason we'd be able to tell is if they're in motion then there'll be greater tension in the rope than if they're at rest. Um, so he says, look, you know, there's this empirically verifiable consequence, namely tension in the rope, um, that could be explained only in terms of their absolute motion. Um, and that's because in a space that contained only these things, there would be no relative motion of the spheres. Uh, the, the spheres aren't moving relative to one another. Uh, the only difference is uh, that in one case, they're moving with respect to space itself. Um, and in the other case, they're, they're moving. Uh, they're not moving with respect to space itself. So they're not moving relative to one another because they're both moving at the same speed um, and uh, in the same direction. That's the idea. Um Okay, so, um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, there's sort of, it's the, the, this is not an insurmountable objection for the relationist, I think it's fair to say. Um, so the relationist might be a bit sceptical about what Newton, Newton says about this, this world where there's nothing but the two spheres and a rope. They might say, well how do we know what would happen in such a world? Why should we suppose that um, there could be two different physical states, one in which there's great attention in the rope and one in which there's not? Uh, presumably the relationist is going to want to just deny this because they're going to say, there's just, since there's only relational movement, there's just, there's just no fact of the matter or no distinction between the case where the the spheres are moving and the case in which they're not in such a world so they 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 they're likely to say well you know um then of course there's no no possibility of there being two different physical states one where there's tension in the rope and one in which the, there isn't so 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 i mean like newton's arguments they're not irresistible, right? So in the kind of the experiment, the bucket experiment, as we perform it, you know, in real life, um, the relationist can also always point out that, well, there are things um, that the bucket is moving with respect to, or the, I should say the water is mo moving with respect to, even though it's not moving with respect to the bucket. It's moving with respect to the room and the, the surface of the earth and the sun and so on. Um, and what they'll say about the hypothetical case is that, well, you know, you can say that you, there's there's a difference between a world in which the spheres are rotating uh, and one in which they're not. Um, but that's just a sort of stipulation on your part, which kind of presupposes that space is absolute. The relation is surely just going to say, well, you know, I deny this, right? I deny there are two cases and I deny that there's going to be two different corresponding states of the rope. So so the, the, maybe the cat, this, this sort of hypothetical experiment, two globes experiment is a bit dodgy. Um, uh, and then it sort of comes down to, uh, I suppose Newton is going to say, well, what about in the bucket case? In the bucket case... Yeah, it's true that there are the the water is moving relative to some stuff, but uh, 
is its motion relative to the room or relative to the surface of the earth? Can that really explain the concavity of the water? So that's sort of where we get to. Um, and um, so no, no, no sort of knockout blow on either side. But um, I think a lot of people think, you know, um, even if it doesn't completely knock out the relationist, um, a lot of people think that uh, Newton's bucket experiment um, does sort of support absolutism, even if it doesn't completely conclusively support it. So may maybe there's a sort of points victory rather than knockout victory um, to to uh to to newton and and the the person who wants to be an absolutist about space on the basis of what we've seen so far however of course next week um and this is the the point at which i'll end this um next week we'll find out that there is in fact uh uh an argument or indeed several arguments that the relationists might make um that seem to cut the other way um and this is part of the reason this debate um you know, has has gone on for, for, for many years um, and is still an interesting one to have today. OK, so that's it for this week. Um, and I will speak to you all next week. So have a good week and um, stay safe.